Hello, welcome to Enlightened Empaths with Samantha and Denise. We are really looking forward to this show. It's becoming a routine for us where every month we take questions that you have sent to us on our Facebook page. Any question that we feel other listeners would enjoy hearing a discussion on and we share them with you. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you for sending in your questions and connecting with us. It's been really exciting for Denise and I to to see the show grow the way it has. Welcome, Denise. Hi. Are you having oh, a good week? I am. And you? Yes, a very good week. It's, it's you know, coming up on the end of January, so it always feels good to get that month out of the way, doesn't it? Oh, very much so. Um, can we also add in a bit about the um, the email account? Oh, it's yes. for connection. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for reminding me. I got an email uh, sent to my website email that said, Hi, Samantha, I want to send a question for you and Denise, but I'm not on Facebook. And I told Denise, and she said, Well, you know, we do have an email address for Enlightened Empaths. I said, No, I did not know that. (laughs) So poor Denise has been handling that on her own. We will now check it both equally. It is enlightenedempaths at gmail.com. Yes. So if someone's not on Facebook or... We don't Twitter yet, but I think that's coming. Do you? <laughs> can I don't know. I think maybe someday. We can pretend anyway. <laughs> yes, we will We will get involved in the 21st century at some point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we also, before we get to the questions, we wanted to let you all know that Denise and I next Wednesday are teaching a webinar, and we really hope you join us. It'd be great to see some of your faces and get to know you. The webinar we're teaching on February 7th is Manifesting Love. We're going to talk about how to manifest love for the new year. So we're going to talk about how you can manifest more self-love, how you can open your heart chakra to manifest more love in your relationships, how to tell the universe that you're ready for love. Some of the handouts that you'll get will include um, heart chakra opening techniques, metaphysical tips, to invite more love into your life, how to use crystals and feng shui for love. We're also going to be having handouts to help you analyze and really look at the patterns of relationships you've experienced thus far and look at what are some commonalities and lessons learned and what is this pattern trying to teach you about your heart. Where You'll get also um, some guided meditations to help you visualize love coming into your life. So it's going to be packed full. We're really excited about it. It's the first time Denise and I are teaching together. We are both teachers in our normal non-psychic life. So this is a natural evolution for us. Um, And on the webinar format, it's just really nice because it's like we're all in a class together. Everyone can talk and share. What we plan on doing is teaching the webinar from 8 to 9 p.m. on the February 7th and then opening it up for questions and discussions the rest of the time. So you'll have plenty of opportunity to connect and share with us and others in the class. That information will be on our Facebook page, Enlightened Empaths, and it will also be on my website, samanthafay.com. Perfect. All right, you want to get started with the questions? I'd love to. Um, I'll jump right in with the first one. Okay. Uh, It says, hello, Samantha and Denise. I want to thank you for your new podcast, Enlightened Empaths. Thank you both of you amazing ladies for the insights and inspiration every week. I'm truly grateful. Not what's written in here, but I want to say how grateful I am, and I'm sure you are as well, that that this is, I love, love, love this connection. I do too. So the person who wrote, I want to share a story about synchronicity that I think you'll find amusing. Last month while driving home and listening to your podcast episode, Connecting with Spirit, I was suddenly, I suddenly felt a bout of grief and started thinking about my grandmother who passed about 18 years ago. She sometimes visits in dreams, but it's been several years since I heard from her or felt her presence. For a minute, I did not understand why I felt so overwhelmed by grief, and in tears, I started to wish my grandmother would let me know more often she is still watching over me. Next, I heard your voice on the podcast talking about signs and saying, maybe asking to see a purple car, since there aren't that many of them, would be a better way to communicate with our loved ones on the other side. As soon as I heard you say that, I looked up and saw a purple car in front of me. Even even more amazing is the fact that the license plate read, Sue's Nana. My grandmother spoke Spanish only, and in Spanish, Sue is a formal way of saying your. If 
I had not taken a picture, I still wouldn't believe it. Blessings and love to both of you. I just love that. I absolutely love that. Um, and, and again, I think we had talked a little bit about when you give something that's that specific, sometimes the person on the other side is able to just come right to bat, give it right back to you. You're in the right place. I was driving, I was in uh, Florida several years ago, and I had gone to have a mediumship reading at, um, what is the camp up in northern Florida? Oh, Casadega? Yes. I think, yes, yeah. Casadega. And I went there, and the woman had said, um, she had brought through a, a friend of mine who had passed from, from an aneurysm. And this woman loved, loved, loved her dog. She had three girls, all this stuff. So I left, and I was thinking about her, and I was driving back down the interstate, and there was a, and her name was Dawn, and, and, but people called her Dee. And on the back of a motorhome right in front of me was this big sign that said D's dogs. And they had brought through this woman with the big dog. There was a picture of Lab right in the back of this motorhome going by. And it, it just, you know, it, it makes you realize how connected we all still are. And I think sometimes when we get caught in this carbon-based place, I don't know why I have to tap my hand every time I say carbon-based, but I do. Um <laughs> That they, they, they want to get in touch with us as much as we want to get in touch with them. That is so true. And I think asking for those signs is comforting not only for us, but also for them. Because it's a way for our loved ones in heaven to go, yes, she gets it. She knows I'm still here, right. that I haven't left. Especially it's been 18 years since she passed. And sometimes... Yes. It's um, the energy is so different after all those years have passed that it's beautiful that she's still able to get those messages through. Uh, just as a reminder, from my experience, our loved ones can give us signs through things like asking for a car, license plate, but also by asking for signs in nature. You can assign a dragonfly, a bluebird, a cardinal, a butterfly. Uh, you can also ask for a specific song that might have been meaningful to the two of you. There's a lot of different ways that you can connect with your loved ones. If your loved ones are open to it before they're transitioning, like let's say you have a grandparent who's in hospice, I think it's such a good idea to ask them while they're alive to send you a sign when they get to heaven. Right. Because that's a nice confirmation that you know you both have vocally said, hey, when you get to heaven and you check in with everyone and you, and you hug grandpa, show me a cardinal or, or what, whatever sign it is that you pick. Right. You know, Denise, have you ever had, when I do readings, sometimes the loved ones that I've connected with a client will come and thank me. Mm -hmm. I had an experience, I did a reading for a lovely young woman and she had lost both her parents. They were, um, I think she was second generation. They were all from Italy. And mm -hmm. I do really, because I'm Italian and Irish and English, if anyone had, I don't know why, it's like the Italians come through me so easily. I guess because I, I grew up with Italian grandparents. I don't know. But it was such a strong, lovely connection. And uh, they just loved her granddaughter. It was just, you know, sometimes readings are just as beneficial to you, the reader, as they are to the client. Mm -hmm. So I'm driving home and I'm feeling all warm and fuzzy about that reading and this white Cadillac pulls out in front of me right in front of this park and I had to kind of, you know, slam on my brakes a little bit and the license plate read Moa Bella and that's what they had called their granddaughter. And so I, oh. I took a picture of it and I texted it to my client and I was like, that is so cool. And I just, I felt this thank you, it kind of come through me like they were just thanking me for connecting her Again, it's not me, it's, you know, we're just the medium, the conduit, but I just, I love when we are able to work in tandem with spirit. Yes, and I think another little piece is if you're not getting that specific thing, so you say purple car, purple car, but don't discount other things that you would connect with that purple, that person in spirit. So if there was a specific food or a specific flower or a specific, something that is, you have no doubt it's about you know, I, I think I've mentioned before my mother and the coconut cream pie. Absolutely favorite, loved it. So I've, I've, you know, I don't. It's not my favorite. Not a big fan. But when I'm, you know, if I, I sit down to a restaurant and the the waitress says, "Oh, and our special dessert today is coconut cream pie," and I happen to be, you know, feeling my mother around at the same time, take that as a sign as well. 
because I think you made a really good point when we had talked before about, you know, it, it's it's a learning curve for, on both sides of the fence for us to connect with them, but also some people in spirit give signs a little more easily than others. Yes, that is so true. You have to think about the personality of the individual you're asking for a sign from. If you are asking your aunt to come through and give you a sign and she was really quiet and shy, it might be harder for her to learn how to navigate energy on the other side to bring you a sign. If you're asking for a specific sign from a loved one and they were really exuberant and loud and kind of obnoxious but in a good way, you're going to get a sign from them very easily because even if they can't figure out how to do it, they will go screaming and yelling through heaven until someone helps them. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you have to look at the personality. Also, you have to look at the um, emotions of the person in heaven. If they died tragically, suddenly, shockingly, Oftentimes they go to what we call a nursing home in heaven, um, a convalescent home where they just have to rest and really heal and repair and recharge their energy. So it will take them a lot longer. I had a good friend who never heard from her grandmother for like two years. And I met her one year into her missing her grandmother. And I couldn't connect with her either. She asked me, please, can you connect with my grandmother? And I, I couldn't, there was nothing. And then about six or eight months later, I had a dream that her grandmother came to me and, and said, when I died, I had full-blown Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. I've just woken up. I, I've been in heaven this whole time resting in a bed of light and I've just woken up. Please tell her I'm okay. Oh. And so sometimes I think we have to consider that as well and then finally, we have to consider our own emotions. When we are consumed with grief, we are wrapped in um, bubble wrap, really, is the way I think about it. Gray, sad, bubble wrap. And it's really hard for them to get anything through to us. When I talk to parents who have lost children, one of their biggest frustrations is that they aren't getting signs from their children. Right. And they get upset because the children are giving signs to, say, their friend or their neighbor um, or their teacher, but their own mom and dad are not getting the signs. And I always tell them, please be patient. It's once your grief, like once you learn to wear your grief and carry it, then they can get their energy through to you. And they always do and they always will. It's just a timing issue and that can be really frustrating. But the more you recognize the signs, no matter how they come or where they come from, the stronger that link and that connection gets and the more easily they can continue bringing you signs. Okay, and two things with that is for anyone who's listening that is a medium or intuitive or working with bringing through spirit, if you're sitting with someone and, they're, and you're giving a lot of evidential stuff or you're bringing through things and they're saying, oh, that sounds just like him, yes, that's a good description, and then you finish up and they're, they're saying, but you didn't give me that, you know, I was waiting for that one thing, that's really putting too much pressure on not only the medium but also the person in spirit because that yes. might not be something that they can bring through. So, and I, I just again, because I do believe we're, we're getting more of an, um, a group of, of people who are, are either already practicing mediums or are opening up to that, don't let that throw you. Don't let that throw you from what the work that you're doing and being, as, as Samantha said, a conduit for spirit. So that's important. And the other thing that I've never had the nursing home kind of a, a, a visual or connection with spirit but i have seen people going through into a door like it, they're going into a classroom they're going into a school there's there is a healing time that some people go through on the other side and time is a man-made constraint we're the carbon based we're the ones again i didn't tap myself that time though okay um, <laughs> But on the other side, there is no time. So so what might seem like an eternity to us for them to get in touch might literally be a snap of the fingers for them. Agreed. And you've got to think about the person you're asking the sign from, again, in different ways. For example, I love animals and nature. 
I'm not so great with technology, obviously. So <laughs> if I'm up in heaven, God willing, 100 years from now, and my my kids or my grandkids ask me for a sign on the computer, you know, if they say like, hey, grandma, if you're with me, make my computer turn on. I don't know that even 100 years from now, I'm going to be able to do that. <laughs> but if you ask me, if my kids or grandkids ask me to show them something in nature or with an animal, my energy is so much more in alignment with that. That would be easy for me to do. Right. So just consider the source, consider who you're asking, what you're asking, and then be open. Okay. Perfect. I feel like we've beaten that to death. So let's. Move yes. On. Okay. <laughs> the next question says, I have three situations that have arisen concerning group dynamics. As an empath, I tend to keep to small groups whenever possible. I have two voluntary groups I belong to, and I love them both, except for the fly and the ointment. In each group, there is one person I find incredibly abrasive and toxic. The toxicity and hostility does not even have to be directed at me. Just being around it is disturbing, and I walk away upset, sometimes for days. I do clearing and cleansing after these encounters and even shield myself before going out. I carry protective crystals, too. There is also an in-law who I avoid as best I can. Sometimes that's not possible, so I attempt to protect myself in those unavoidable situations as well. My question is, is spirit trying to tell me something here? I see a pattern. Is there some life lesson for me to learn? If so, I'd love to know how I can learn it so I can move on. Sadly, I am on the verge of leaving both of these groups in order to protect myself. Your thoughts would be most welcome. I am listening. And I think that that is an incredible question in the sense of, just from a personal perspective, I had a situation a couple of weeks ago where a woman called. She was not adversarial, but she said some things that were really, um, you would say to a dear friend, you wouldn't say to someone you were calling about a reading. It, it was just, it was very odd. It was almost an attacking kind of thing. And I got off the phone and I was kind of just just a little pissed off from it. And then I sat down and I thought, and I thought, oh my gosh, that felt the same as when I've been attacked by my sister. And it, it was the same emotional reaction that I had. And I, I kind of laughed because I thought, you know, am I, when you think you've, you've completed a cycle or you've done your healing work, someone's going to keep showing up and testing you on that. Have you really done your work? And I think a lot of the stuff when we, if we are attracting or we're ending up in situations where there is someone who, who is that toxic to us, are we replaying a lesson that we need to learn from someone earlier in our life? Well said, Denise. I agree. I think, well, first of all, I love that she ended her email, I am listening. Yes. I thought that was so beautiful and such an energy of surrender. Like I am, you know, she's clearly working on this. That alone is answer to her question. You know, like she's listening, she's open, she's recognizing the pattern. So I feel like she will figure this out anyway without us discussing it, obviously. But I do also feel, because I've dealt with these situations in my own life, I know you have too. I think every empath has, well, every human has dealt with a toxic person. I just feel that intuitive empaths feel it so much more deeply and it affects mm -hmm. us so much longer, which is why it's important to kind of pull that weed out at its source. But as you all know, we can't change anyone around us. We can only change ourselves and our responses to these people. So I agree with Denise that you need to look at the pattern and see where is this rooted and what what is this trying to teach me about who I am. So one of the things I would recommend she do is think about the emotions that these negative people are triggering in her. Is she feeling afraid? Is she feeling anger? Is she feeling judgmental or judged? So look at the uh, definition, identify the emotion that you're feeling when you're around this negative person, and then ask yourself, what am I trying to learn about my fear? Or what am I here to learn about feeling judged? What am I here to learn about anger? And see where those questions lead you and see what your pattern is for you, not for the toxic people in your life, but for you. For me, a lot of the toxic people in my life triggered this pleasing response in me. Whenever I'm around a negative person, 
my first response is to try to cheer them up. I don't mm-hmm. enjoy being around negative people, but I also feel, I always feel bad for negative people. Mm-hmm. Remember that quote you put on our Facebook page? Sometimes the worst thing about being an empath is you even feel bad for the assholes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that quote. And what that does when I feel bad for the negative person in my life, I then try to be the cheerleader and pick them up and go, hey, it's not that bad. And and while that looks lovely on the outside, on the inside, it's weakening my empowerment and it's it's compelling me to want to please these people and make them feel better about who they are and about the situation. And that's never a good thing. So I've learned to um, stop trying that to do that. And that has changed relationships in my life drastically and in really good ways. The other thing though, Denise, and I would love to do a show on this if you ever wanted to, the far extreme, and I don't know if her email is going to this extreme, But I do think that there are people that are just so negative and toxic that the best avenue is no contact. Right. You know, is to just walk away. The one thing that really popped out with me in this in this little note, though, as well, is that these are voluntary groups and that she loves both of them, like really loves doing this and is being of service if it's a volunteer piece. So what kind of the underlying thing, I almost sense like a a, a bit of jealousy or someone who needs to be in the limelight rather than have a a group approach to to what's going on. And and I know we talk about the shielding and the protection a lot, but I almost feel like if, if, and the, the crystals in this as well, and we have talked about that is, you know, if you carry a crystal in your pocket and you're seeing this toxic person, one of the little tricks I do in my work environment is, I'll just casually reach in my pro- pocket and grab that stone so that it, it grounds me, it reminds me that I'm okay. But to, to protect yourself, to send it back, to, to do the mirror work, I think that it would be a shame for the group to lose this woman or this person, we don't know there's a woman, lose this person um, and what they're bringing to, to the, the situation. Yes, I think that's a great point. Okay, do you want to read the next question? Yes. Um, Hi, I had a question about an upcoming transition. My significant other got his dream job five hours away in his hometown. I'll join him once we find a house, and my job is letting me work from home after I move. I'm very excited for this, but won't be getting as many hours. I've taken this as a sign that perhaps this is my chance to step out as an intuitive and do something in that field. But I have no idea where to start. Can you help me? Thank you for all your wonderful work you're doing for Empaths. And thank you for stepping out of your comfort zone and starting your business. Um, I think that this is just a beautiful, beautiful little note as far as how exciting that, you know, you get this opportunity. Talk about, you know, spirit literally putting both hands on your back and giving you a push off the precipice. You know what? We're going to give you another job. You can work from home. You you have all of the, the, the partner has a dream job. So that takes some of the stress off of you in this move. Um, I think this is fabulous. I do too. And I think this is the way spirit often works to encourage us to take that leap of faith. She's going to have this opportunity to work from home. She's going to have a fresh start and a new beginning. The key, I think, would be once our guides open a door for us, we can still sit in that room for the rest of our lives staring at the open door. It's up to us to walk through it. So I would encourage her to really recognize the signs and synchronicities that happen when she moves and follow through with those and to also make the effort to connect with like-minded people and yes. to really work on networking with others in her com- in her new community and see where that leads. Uh, next week, Denise and I are going to be interviewing a, a very inspiring empathic entrepreneur and we'll tell you more about that at the end of the show. But one of the things that she was talking about when we were preparing for the interview um, was how she had to really focus on not listening to any naysayers and just following her passion and following her heart and just listening to that inner voice. And that's what ultimately brought her success. Right. And, And I think that that's exactly. And if you're not able to connect with people in this new community with, you know, a physical presence, start something online. We are in a prime, prime time right now. 
um, energetically and astrologically to really set some new goals and co-create with the universe. It, it's just, it's amazing. As for, so the, her timing with this move is beautiful. Um, I agree. And, and also, it just feels, what I'm getting a sense is that this has been a long time coming and it's finally a, a very desired thing to do as an intuitive. It's not like, oh, I think I'm going to be an intuitive. It feels like this has been a long process for this person. Yes. And it's an exciting time to start that. I, I feel different about this new year. It feels positive. It does. And more and more people are stepping into their, their own light and their own inner knowing and saying, this is what I came here to do. And I think that the, the timing for this woman in the note, but also so many people that are listening, take, a, take one little step. And truly, I just, I, something energetically feels like this is an amazing time to to really open those doors for yourself and not as you said which was a beautiful analogy not just sitting in that room and waiting okay now how do i get to the door one little step and then another one it's amazing what's going to happen i i truly believe that and i think when we're going through these big changes it's up to us to work on keeping ourselves inspired and motivated so yeah. try to ignore those naysayers try to ignore the inner negative self-talk and just take steps to prepare. Even if, let's say, she wants to start this business but she's not really ready or she needs to save more money, that's fine. She can still spend her evenings going on, you know, Vistaprint or Moo and look at designing business cards. She could still go to her community college and take a small business class. She could still connect with a web designer and just get ideas about creating her own website. She could join in our town, and I live in the Bible Belt. We have a healing, <laughs> we have a healers network, and once a month they meet at I think the Unitarian Church, and it's just any healer that wants to come and connect. So yoga people, Reiki, massage therapists, cranial sacral workers, and they'll connect and share and talk about what they're doing. So there's so many ways to get involved with the community and to take steps toward your goal and your dream without you know fully taking that leap but i think if you take action in some way every day to keep yourself inspired and motivated you know read books listen to books about people who have done what you want to do watch how they did it learn study that way when you know what's what's that expression denise if you want your ship to come in you've got to build a dock Mm -hmm. You know, so work on building that dock so that when that ship comes in, you're ready to jump on it and sail away into success. Okay, I'm going to read the next question. Okay. Hello, I have a funny story to share. I think it was on this podcast, but it could have been Psychic Teachers as I listened to both. Two months ago, I suffered a miscarriage and was devastated. After the miscarriage, I decided to make a manifestation journal after listening to an episode. You had given a specific example about manifesting pregnancies. I use something similar along the lines of, I easily get pregnant, I have a healthy and easy pregnancy, I easily deliver a healthy, easygoing baby. I found out a couple of weeks ago that I am pregnant again. My first OB appointment isn't until the 30th, but I made a visit for yesterday to be seen due to some concerns I had over the weekend. The doctor did an ultrasound in the office and found two gestational sacs. Looks like I should have been more specific and said one baby when writing it down in my journal, lol. I said to have, I have to have a diagnostic ultrasound next week to monitor the growth of the babies. I love your podcast. Thank you for all you do. Isn't that awesome? That's beautiful too. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, just the power of letting, getting out of the way and allowing Yes. Um, and, and you brought up a good point before about uh, m miscarriages and those babies and the soul work. If you could go into that a little bit, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, I've done a lot of readings where uh, souls who have been miscarried will come through with messages. And it's been really interesting and, and enlightening to see some of the reasons why souls choose to be miscarried. What I have learned is that Every soul knows before they incarnate in the in the womb whether they are going to be miscarried or aborted or go to full term. It's it's an agreement that happens beforehand. 
And oftentimes a soul is miscarried because they're just not ready. You know, like they might make their whole plan and and then they're like, okay, let's do this. And then they, they start the process and they're like, oh, wait, wait, wait. I think I added way too many tough lessons for myself. I'm vacating and redoing the plan. And in those cases, when those souls decide to vacate the plan and take a time out, they come back and they come back to that family. They come back to that mother. Um, I've seen that time and time and time again. Sometimes a soul will choose to miscarry or oftentimes I see this more with um, abortion to serve, to be of service to the mother, to serve as a wake up call. That is an opportunity for a time out for the mother to say, let's look at this relationship. Let's look at your life. Let's look at what's happening here. And so sometimes I'll see that when something just needs to be reconfigured. And I want to just expressly point out, I've seen with so many of my own friends and my clients that when a mother miscarries, there tends to be an energy of guilt and self-blame. And I think, Denise, you've you've been pregnant a couple of times like I have. Don't Mm -hmm. you think it's one of the most amazing and most difficult things at the same time? Yes. We, We doubt ourselves. We question ourselves. And so a lot of times when women have a miscarriage, they just go into this blame mode. You know, was it that glass of wine I had before I knew I was pregnant? And everything I've discovered in my readings is that it's just, that's never the case. And it's it's not a good way to go. It's not any good, nothing good is going to come out of kicking yourself. Most of these souls will come back. I want to share a really nice story about a friend of mine who had a miscarriage. And it was it was devastating. She had waited a long time for this little one and and really was excited to bring him into the world and when she miscarried him I kept getting the message I'm coming back I'm coming back it's not the time it's not the right time but I'm coming back and I told her that and she kind of you know she just kind of looked at me like thanks I think you're making that up you know like I just got the feeling that she thought I was trying to cheer her up but I kept hearing that so strongly The other reason why she didn't believe me is because the way her husband responded to the miscarriage was so cold and so aloof that she ended up divorcing him. And so she said to me, I don't think that soul's coming back. You know, and she was like, it's fine. Her her two kids at the time were were in their preteen years and she was 40 and she said you know i've i've raised my family and and i'm divorced now and it's it's totally fine within a year of saying that she was remarried and pregnant and that little guy came right on back wow so i do feel that that happens a lot with miscarriages that they come back and just just i'd like to add one part for for anyone who's listening who may have had multiple miscarriages and is so Um, that's an incredibly lonely, fear-based place of, is this going to happen? Will I be able to have a baby? Will I be able to? I I just truly, that has to be one of the most difficult things that that women go to, especially if they're feeling like they have less time in the future to have a child. So um, you had brought up something um, when we talked yesterday about being open to other options and, and to not, I think your point about not beating yourself up or not owning that there's something wrong with you, that the, these babies aren't staying, or these, I, I think that's really, really important because it can become just such a, a focus in your life and impact everything. Yes, I agree. I was sharing a story with you. I have a friend who had several miscarriages, just one after another after another. And I kept telling her, I kept, I got the feeling intuitively that she was meant to adopt. And she Mm -hmm. was really resisting that, and her husband wouldn't even consider it. So, you know, you can't push in those situations. But I said to her, here's an affirmation I just want you to say every day. One way or another, I'm going to be a mother. And just say that over and over. And she said, okay. And within, I want to say nine months, it was less than a year, situations occurred at her church And a woman just walked up to her and said, uh, my daughter is pregnant and she wants to give the baby up for adoption. You know, would you consider? And I think because she knew the family and knew the situation and 
I, I just think it was different than going to an adoption agency. She couldn't mm-hmm. get there. That she said, yes, I'll never forget. She called me up one day. I had no clue this was going on. And she said, can I borrow your pack and play right now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, sure. Are you having family over? And she said, no, I have just adopted a baby. It was, I still get chills oh, thinking about it. I did too. It was so beautiful. Anyway, so I, I think that oftentimes when we're so focused on our life is going to turn out this way. I am going to have, you know, this child naturally or, or what have you. All of that can just put up blocks. If we, if we could create our life exactly the way we wanted it at every moment, I think life would get a little boring. It's kind of mm-hmm. fun to learn to go with the rolls and punches of life. Growing up, I used to tell everybody I was going to have boys. Mm-hmm. I was sure I was going to have boys. I dreamed about boys. I have three knitted blankets that are blue because I was so sure I was having boys. <laughs> <laughs> and God decided to give me three girls. And thank God he did. Because now that I have these girls who, you know, of course I love and I couldn't see having anyone else, but I also see how ridiculously girly I am. And I don't know how good of a mom I would have been to boys. So sometimes <laughs> we think we know best and we really don't. And so it's just good to have that attitude of surrender with all of this. Also, big, big congratulations to the lady who wrote the note. That's that's such exciting news and, and beautiful. Really is. I love it. Thanks for sharing that. So the next question, on a totally different track. I just discovered that my husband has been having an emotional affair with a young woman. My stomach is in total knots. How do I cope emotionally? What kind of tools will help me? I'm not very good at meditation, but I obviously need my guides and angels right now. How do I get them and hear them when I'm so out of sorts? And I think that that's a huge, huge point is when we're so overwhelmed with grief, with fear, with anxiety, with anger, it's so, so, so hard to hear the messages, to sense that, to feel the presence. It's also, um, for highly sensitive people, for empaths, we can, just just as an aside, we can really get in our own heads and get on that loop tape and not be able to break, like, everything. It's just, like, over and over, playing the same scenarios, feeling like it, it's... And one trick that I've used, um, and it, it's, it's when you're in that dark place and you can't shake is if there's a prayer, if there's a meditation, if there's a rote expression that you can just say over and over to yourself, it's going to help you break that loop tape. Whether whether it's a, a, you know, the Lord's Prayer or a Hail Mary or or Judaism, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It can be um, one day at a time. It can be this too shall pass. But just say it to yourself over and over again, and at least it's going to buffer that. It's going to get you off the loop tape. Um, which is, I think, a very important first step. I agree. I think the discovery of something like this is traumatizing. Mm-hmm. If you look at the research of people who have discovered their spouse or partner was having an affair, a lot of the research says that it puts you into a type of PTSD. And so when we're in that shock and trauma of betrayal, it's very hard for our guides to get through to us. It's important to recognize and remember that they are with us even if we can't see them, hear them, or feel them. Sometimes when you've gotten through the shock and trauma and you're able to look back, you can see where your guides were. You can see the serendipity, the synchronicity, the coincidence, the guidance that came when you least expected it. But when we're in it, it's very hard to. I think dealing with a betrayal on this level has many, many layers of grief to it. Again, going back to the miscarriage question, I think when a spouse or partner cheats on us, there is often an attitude of self-blame again. What did I do mm-hmm. wrong? What right. what could I have done better? Uh, why wasn't I good enough? Right. And that's going to get you into a spiral of nowhere fast. Um, I think that uh, personally, I think people who choose to go outside of their marriage, whether it's an emotional affair or a physical affair, I just think they're not nice people. Um, I've heard a lot of excuses from other clients of, oh, well, my marriage wasn't working out, or, you know, oh, he was never home, so I had no choice. I personally think that's all BS. 
I think if you are thinking about having an affair, you need to talk to a divorce attorney first <laughs> before well, and, breaking someone's heart. And and if you've been, I think anyone who has been in this situation, and and I agree with the PTSD thing, and not not to the extent of someone who's been in a war zone or or anything like that. Not 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 discounting that at all, as you no. had mentioned yes. yesterday when we spoke. But the other piece is. As a highly sensitive person, don't feel like you, it, you, you. It's going to rock your world more than if you were just like, oh well, he made that choice or she made that choice. So honor that within yourself that it's okay to feel that pain, uh, because that's a step in healing. Uh, the other thing, um, yes, with the connection is don't look for signs that aren't there. Like you may feel like everything is pointing you in the direction about the affair, and it might be. The support you're looking for but your head is in such that place that um, you can't break free and, and see see other messages that might be coming through and I also don't you feel that a lot of manipulative people tend to seek out empaths oh my goodness yes you know because we're so kind or we at least try to be so kind so one thing I would suggest to her too is do not allow yourself to be manipulated by more lies dig get the truth get the facts you will be empowered by taking act positive action to find out how far this goes and the other thing i would say is rely on your intuition mm -hmm. this partner might lie to you but your intuition never will and it's so important now more than ever to trust that right. and also i did respond to her uh, message when it came through because i just really felt for her and I told her, I said, if you can, get somebody on your side that you trust implicitly, like a sibling or a best friend, someone that you know whatever you say to them is going to be kept in confidence, and talk this through. I think talking is such positive therapy. If you can go to a therapist, try that. There are lots of therapists now that work on sliding pay scales or pro bono. Um, and if you can't talk to anyone, if it's just not in your nature to share these personal details, then write it out. And Denise, can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Because I think you have such good insights on the healing aspect of writing. Yes, and it, it's saved. That's been my saving grace. Because it, one thing is if, if this is going on and you're in a community where you're both known or there's friends involved or kids involved and you don't want it to to you know cause this huge devastating ripple effect or your I don't I, my phone's on airplane I'm sorry it's doing that um but I just feel like as well that you're um you it's a place to really vent and let it go and and rage and cry and, and just because getting out that toxicity that's building up in you is going to give you the strength but it's also going to help you to have a conversation. If you write out what you'd like to say, you know, that might be really colorful and really graphic and not, <laughs> not in your highest and best to use those choice of words. If you can get that out on paper and then when you do have a face to space conversation or you are in a more, you're trying to, to heal this or you're trying to, to explain it to a counselor, at least you'll have gotten that initial rage and, and fear and it, the devastation out of the way so that you can have more clarity with what you need to say to someone in person. I agree. And, you know, I've also found a lot of support on online communities. Yes. You know, if you're going through something like this, there's a lot of great online chats that talk about what to do when your spouse cheats, and I think that's incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. And if she and her partner choose to work on this, I personally don't recommend doing that on your own. I really do think a marriage counselor is needed here. There are also retreats throughout the country. There's one in um, Tennessee, I believe, that you can you and your partner go to just to work on cheating and betrayal. There's a lot of help and resources out there for people who have gone through dealing with a cheating partner. It's not easy. It's a long ordeal. But I would not ever please think that your guides aren't there for you, loving you and supporting you and cheering you on. Again, going back to our first question, if you really need to hear from your guides and you're not, ask for a specific sign and ask them to show it to you within a specific time frame. 
So say, dear guides, I feel really alone. I feel angry. I feel betrayed. I need to know you're with me. Please, in the next 72 hours, show me a... And then fill in the blank. Right. Our next question says, good morning from Ireland. I will, I flicked through my podcast this morning and decided to listen to your Q&A. And boy, talk about synchronicity. My boss is very negative, a bully, and can be aggressive and manipulative. And I've been struggling for the past few days with this. So when the first question was on this topic, when I listened this morning, I smiled, cried, and smiled some more. Talk about timing. I feel so much more able to cope with the day now and will work more on preparing and protecting myself and learning from this situation. It's not the first, so I'm obviously not learning the lesson. You ladies are awesome. Thank you for all you do, all your hard work and amazing energy. Love and light to you both. Well, that's a lovely email. I just want to say, uh, well, first of all, thank you for listening to us from Ireland. And second Mm -hmm. of all, when she says, this is not my first time learning this lesson, so I'm obviously not learning it. I just want to say that might not be true. Sometimes when we learn a lesson, it comes back to us just to kind of make sure we've learned all aspects of that lesson. It's kind of like in school, you take a quiz and then you take a test. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't mean you haven't learned the material. The teacher is just making sure that you've retained what you've learned. So I just don't want her to look at herself going through this issue with her negative boss and think, well, I guess I haven't learned something. Again, going back to that self-blame piece. Right. That's a very good point. I also think um, just, you know, the fact that it resonated. And that's another reason that we were both so excited about doing this podcast is so many of the things that come up, I think in the question and answers, there's so many people listening or that when when I read them, it's like, oh my gosh, I remember feeling that way or I've been through that. It's building that sense of community and that connection between all of us. And I, I really, I absolutely love that. And I think it's an important, important piece that you may have just listened to that and said, that's my life right there. Know that the message coming through because the, the ones that end up coming on the air I truly think that we, they're, they're hitting more than just the one person we're answering. And I think there's a reason why we hear things at certain times. You know, people will say to me, I don't know how I found your podcast, but I'm glad I did. And mm-hmm. I feel like certain things like that will pop up just when you need them. You know, I'll have, I love you guys so much. You guys know I love books. And so oftentimes you'll send me book recommendations, you know, hey, Samantha, I love your show. Just finished this book. I think you'd like it too. And sometimes I'll get that email with a book that's exactly what I need to read at that mm-hmm. time. And I, I think it's cool that that's the way it works. Speaking of which, the next question, I just found your podcast and I've been listening to at least two a day. Your words are so encouraging and helpful to someone who's just waking up and learning about their abilities. I particularly have a hard time being with certain groups of people, which I know is common for empaths, but this is not a group of people I have the luxury of avoiding. It's my in-laws. So I'm wondering if you might touch base on how I could do better in these situations. I've not been accepted by my husband's family, and feeling their feelings towards me is specifically taxing, to say the least. Ooh, that's, that's a tough a one. one. You know why this is so hard is because that affects your marriage. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be really, really, really difficult. I think the best way to deal with that is to send love to that situation and try to heal and reach out to them in a way that is comfortable to you. Because what this is going to do, if you don't get along with your in-laws, it affects your marriage and it also affects your children because then they might not have a good relationship with their grandparents. And I think all of that can be difficult. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, I also think, though, is just, you know, as, as the mother of sons, is I want them to be happy. I want the woman that they're with to to love them and cherish them. So perhaps if your in-laws start to realize that their son truly does love you and appreciates you and cherishes you, and there's reciprocity there, because that's that's the other piece is you married this man and I'm sure you love him dearly um, and to not let the other fringe stuff impact that like as you said don't let it it can have a big impact on your family but I think too that, that maybe once your in-laws start to realize that you are a good thing in this man's life 
and that you my my gut feeling is that you're very kind you're very thoughtful you're an empath you're trying to figure this out um and and it, i agree with samantha in the sense that they they will start to um, accept you more for who you are not who they want you, who they may be nudging you to be or <laughs> if that makes any sense mm-hmm. yeah and i think that's where that one of those four agreements comes into play don't make assumptions right When you're merging two families, it's one of the hardest things I think we will ever do. And there's always these assumptions. Well, we always do Christmas at my mom's house. Well, now you're a, you know, you're a part of a new family that you are creating. So all of that stuff needs to be negotiated, in my opinion, before the wedding. Mm -hmm. You need to figure out who's going to get what holiday. It's tricky and it can take a lot of time, but I think it's worth it to work through it. I think it's worth it to bite your tongue sometimes. Well, that's what I was going to say. Sometimes you need to compromise. And mm-hmm. if if your mother-in-law is hell-bent that everybody's going to be there for Christmas dinner and that's a tradition, and then that might be one you have to suck it up and say, okay, that's what we're doing. And mm-hmm. I'm just using that as an example, but it might, you may have build your own traditions, I guess is what I'm I'm thinking. There may be something else you can can do that would be specific for what you want to do with your own nuclear family. Exactly. And it, it's worth it in the long run sometimes to do that. Now, here's a fun little metaphysical cure, though. You can take a bowl of sugar. Um, I like to put some rose quartz in the bowl of sugar to add more love to it. And then mm-hmm. write their name or names on a piece of paper and put it in the, the, the small bowl of sugar and just huh. keep that tucked away. And that is said to bring love and peace and a gentle, sweet energy to them so that when they're with you, it's not as negative. You should have seen me the other... I have I have someone's name in a bowl of sugar in the back of my pantry. And the other day I was trying to make these cookies and I was out of sugar and I thought, should I? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably so much negative mojo on that little bowl of sugar. <laughs> but it works, I swear. It's kind of freaky, but it does work. All right, here's our, um, I think this will have to be our last question because we're almost out of time. I have a question for your Q&A, which kind of goes along with a previous question about numerology. I have a birth name and an adoptive name, and I was curious what number I should use for numerology. I had my birth name until I was adopted when I was three. Also, I do not feel any connection to the adoptive name and the person it is associated with. So I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Thank you. I loved your show. Okay, so in numerology, there are there is an answer for this. The name that you are given at birth that's on your birth certificate, that is considered your destiny number. So let's say that all the letters in your name that you were given at birth that is printed on your birth certificate, let's say those all add up to the number one. That means that your destiny is to be an individual, to be independent, to be an entrepreneurial spirit, to have that go, 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 ambitious drive energy. Now let's say you know, when she was three, she got a new name. If she's still going by that name and her bills, her credit cards, uh, her work calls her that name, her friends call her that name, that's considered your life path number. And that's the energy that you're giving out to the world on a daily basis. Let's say, for example, that's a three. Then that means that right now the energy you're giving out is someone who's creative, a great listener, funny, a great friend, Um, humorous, great connecting and talking to other people, a little bit different from that one energy. And so sometimes if we don't feel connected to a name that we're going by now, or we're not into the energy that we're putting out into the universe now, you can make a really significant shift in your life by changing that. It's the destiny name number that we can never change that's given to us at birth, it's our destiny, it's what we're here to work on, it's what we're here, it's our goals. But the number that's associated with the name you go by, you can change that. You can change a letter in your name to switch that. You can go back to your original name at birth. If you're divorced, you can go back to your maiden name, all sorts of different things you can do. But it's fun to play around with that. 
I love um, Glynis McCann's book. I think it's just called Glynis Has Your Number. Mm -hmm. It's such an easy... I've read so many books on numerology and taken so many classes, and that is still my go-to because it's so easy. She lays it out so easily to learn from. So I'd recommend reading her book because she talks about that a lot and the difference between the destiny number and the name number that you have now. Do you want to add anything to that? Or um, No, I did a little little mini workshop one time with a woman who was doing um, numerology, and her name was Penny, and, and she spelled it with an E at the end. And, and she said, I added that on, and it completely changed my life. She said for years, I and she listed all the things she had struggled with, and she did all these things. And she said, so truly, if there's something you want to shift in your life, and you've oh, it's been cyclical, you may want to look at the numerology of your name. This lady also brought up like your your home address and how uh, like if you're buying a house and the numbers and what that is and and I had told her what the numbers on my and she said ooh and I thought oh and I said colorful words and she said well you could put like that number with an A after it or you could put she said that's another way to shift the energy I don't know how thrilled the postal service might be with that but I'm just oh no there's an easier way when you open up your front door. It's like I call it the inner lip of the front door, you know, like where the deadbolt is or what have you. Uh huh. Right there, up where, so no one can see it unless the door's open. You can write a number to change the energy of your house, or you can. I just go to Home Depot and get their little like mailbox numbers, and I add yeah. it there. I switch oh, the energy of my house all the time. <laughs> okay. I do because, like, some like around around the holidays, I'll make it a six because six is the number of families and everyone getting along and getting together. Um, when I'm trying to send out material for writing, I'll add a number so that my house adds up to a three because that's the number of you know writing and creating and communicating and networking. If I'm working on increasing my income, I'll add a number so my house adds up to an eight because that's the number of Ooh. money and earning. So I, I do that a lot. Very cool. That's a good tip. That's a very good tip. Okay, so um, as a reminder, Denise and I are teaching a website next week, Manifesting Love. That's February 7th at 8 p.m., and we really hope you can join us for that. Um, all the information and details will be on our website or on my Facebook, I'm sorry, on my website page. Also, the following week on February 13th, I'm teaching a class, a webinar on beginner's crystals. So if you're looking about learning more about crystals, how to purchase a crystal, how to cleanse a crystal, how to charge a crystal, how to work with them, what does it mean when people say, you know, meditate with a crystal, how to set up a grid, where to put big crystals in your home for optimum use, all of that stuff will be covered in that webinar, and that is February 13th at 8 p.m. Also, Denise and I are starting a new segment to our show in addition to the monthly Q&A. We are also going to be doing a monthly interview show called The Enlightened Entrepreneur, and we're going to be interviewing exciting empaths who are embracing their entrepreneurial skills and creating the career they want. Denise, do you want to tell them about our guest next week? Yes, next week we're starting this off with an incredible young woman um, who is, she runs a skincare line, she does advocacy work, she's a writer, she's a published author, uh, Ashley Asty, and you can find her at ashleyasty.com. Incredible interview and just in, so, so empowering to listen to someone else who is stepping into their own, stepping into their light. It's also I'm just so, so excited about this new segment because it's going to bring that light to so many of you, but also say, wow, that's what I want to do, or that's how I think of things. So it's another way where we're connecting all of us together as one. Yes. And we're hoping that it inspires you. What well, we had such great feedback from our creating the career you want podcast. If you haven't listened to that, check it out. It's in um, the archives of iTunes. So many people said, wow, that really inspired me. I don't like the career I'm in. I want to make a change, but I don't know how. And so what Denise and I are hoping is that this segment will give you some tips and tools and just some food for thought to think about, you know, how short our life is in retrospect and, and what a waste of time it is to spend so many years working at a job you don't love. So we're hoping that this segment will inspire people to create the career they want and really start living their life in alignment with their sole purpose. I think that's the best thing an empath can do for themselves. So we hope you like it too. 
after we um, first spoke to Ashley, though, Denise, I did feel lazy. <laughs> she's she's amazing. incredible. She really is. I think you guys will love her story. I think you'll be inspired by all the beautiful work she does. So we hope you tune in for that. If you have some time this week, please leave us a comment or a review on iTunes. It helps other people to find us. So we really appreciate you all doing that. We've already gotten so many wonderful comments and reviews. And Denise and I are just in awe that you all take time out of your day to do that. It means the world to us. If you like the show, please consider telling a friend about it so that we can continue to grow our community of enlightened empaths. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to show up, do great work, and share your light. Have a great week.